Good morning. Uh, before we begin, I want to thank Ron Meyer for stepping in for RevCap today. It's always a pleasure to have you, Ron. Would please rise as you are able and join me in reading um, the response called worship. As God has turned to us and heard our cries, let us wait patiently for our God. We are lifted up, and he is set on rock, and we have a firm place to stand. God puts new songs in our hearts, hymns of praise. Our hope is that many will see and believe and put their trust in God. Shalom, salam, hang on, pause, peace, amen. This is the time in our worship when in faith we open our hearts to ministry. Now, in prayer, we welcome God's spiritual embrace, and together we say, Divine parent, we thank you for your goodness, grace, and mercy. Often our lives and circumstances are overwhelming, and we feel fragile or broken. But today we are in the moment of country presence. May goodness inspire our actions, may grace focus our vision, and may mercy calm the storms of our We are grateful for your guiding hand, and that peace may reign within us all our days. Hear our praise as we share our blessings among all your children. Eternal source of creativity and love, here and now our silent prayers. To all our silent prayers, let the people say, Amen. 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 God, who is our foundation and our eternal source of life, helps us strength, helps us find strength for our journeys of trust and discipleship. Amen. Amen. Let us now receive the word. Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading comes to us from Psalms 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, Yahweh, I lift up my soul. My God, I trust in you. Don't let me be ashamed. Don't let my enemies triumph over me. No, none who hope in you will be ashamed. But shame will come to the wantonly treacherous. Show me your ways, Yahweh. Teach me your path. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are, my, are the God of my salvation. I wait all day long for you. Remember your mercies, Yahweh, your love your ancient and unwavering love. Pardon the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. Remember me because of your goodness, Yahweh. And how good and upright you are, Yahweh. You instruct sinners in the path. You guide the humble in what is right and teach them your way. All of your paths, Yahweh, are full of love and faithfulness for those who keep your covenant and your testimonies. Here ends the Hebrew scripture reading. Today's gospel reading is in Luke. 10, 25 to 37. Would you stand, please? An expert on the law stood up to put Jesus to the test and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit everlasting life? Jesus answered, What is written in the law? How do you read it? The expert of the law replied, You must love the Most High God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, You have answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. 
but the expert of the law, seeking self-justification, pressed Jesus further. And just who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, There was a traveler going down from Jer Jerusalem to Jericho who fell prey to robbers. The traveler was beaten, stripped naked, and left half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road. The priest saw the traveler lying beside the road, but passed by on the other side. Likewise, there was a Levite who came the same way. This way, too, saw the afflicted traveler and passed on the other side. But a Samaritan who was taking the same road also came upon the traveler and, filled with compassion, approached the traveler and dressed the wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then the Samaritan put the wounded person on a donkey, went straight to the inn, and took care of the injured one. The next day the Samaritan took out two silver pieces and gave them to the innkeeper with a request. Look after this person, and if there be any further expense, I'll repay you on the way back. With all these three, in your opinion, was the neighbor to the traveler who fell in with the robbers? Which of these three? The answer came, the one who showed compassion. Jesus replied, then go and do the same. Thanks. Thanks to God. God. Amen. Hello, my name is Ron Meyer, and I'm the uh, I'm a member of this church, and presently I'm doing an interim ministry in Simi Valley. And um, it's a part-time position, so I have this week off, and I get to be with you, and it's a great place to be, and I thank you for having me be here. Um, how many have heard a sermon on the Good Samaritan before? Uh, all the clergy that are here, how many have preached on the Good Samaritan before? Okay. All right, so we're going to do something different today. We're going to get some exercise now. Are you ready? I want you to uh, get up, take your chairs, and kind of form a circle into the middle here because we're going to have a discussion about this and not a sermon about this. So if you would, please, just right where you are, just kind of turn your chairs in so that we can kind of in a circle right here and we can have a discussion. that are out there want to come in just a little bit and I'll have to speak up and go all have to speak up and we'll see if we can get this done. Now this is good. This is good. I'm going to tell you a little about, about my Simi Valley Church. Uh, they have a multi-purpose room much like this and they have a small congregation smaller than this one and uh, they're looking at ways of where they can turn their church into a coffee house church. They have a, a church building that uh, is a, maybe a little bit smaller than this room, but then the next room next to it is this gigantic kitchen. It's about 75% uh, the size of the sanctuary. And I, when I went to look at the place, I said, what is the United Church of San uh, Kitchen? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> we do all that. So what we're going to be doing in the summer, we're going to test this out. We're going to... Uh, be seated in a circle around tables like this and instead of having worship and social hour we're going to have social hour and worship at the same time so people can sit here with their coffee and their donuts and their cookies and then we'll have worship service and the the, uh, the uh, sermon will not be a sermon it will be more of a discussion such as this so you are an experiment for me to see if I can do that. <laughs> Thank you. And, and I, knew, I knew you were just the right, great group of people to help me do this. So let's talk about the Good Samaritan, if you would. Uh, first of all, let's look at the roles of people who are there. Who are the characters in the story of the Good Samaritan? Who do we have first? A priest. A priest. And a Levite. And a Samaritan. What's that? That's one of the leaders, uh, legal leaders of the uh, religious community. Um, <laughs> Tribal Levi, right? Yeah. What? There's another character here. The, the victim. The victim. The victim. Everybody <coughs> forgets the victim. They all can name these other people, but there's a victim here. 
How many times in your life have you been a victim? Okay, all right. All right. So, so really, what you ought to, when you read this story, you ought to identify with that person. And I'll tell you a little about myself. When I grew up in uh, uh, my church when I was about in the third grade, we had, a, you know, back in the 50s, great big Sunday school, youth leaders, Christian education, huge. But anyway, for a, a Christian education Sunday, we acted out parables. And I got to be one of the people that acted out the Good Samaritan. And I got to be the a victim. victim. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have to and, take the clothes off? No, I didn't have to do that. But I had to get hit and beat and turned around and flipped over and rile and pain and all that kind of stuff. And, they, and you know, I got an award for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it was good training because in high school, my senior year in high school, I was in the, the musical The Fantastics. And I played Mortimer, the man who died. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen that show, but there's a guy who takes two minutes to die. <laughs> and, and he rides and wiggles and pains and goes through contortions in about two minutes and gets a lot of laughs. Anyway. So I was uh, prepared to be the victim in my life. So I had a lot of training. <laughs> so, now I'm sure a lot of you know about victimhood in other ways. I don't know if, I don't want to invade your privacy, but does anybody want to tell me a story about being a victim in your life? Anybody want to offer a story? Yes, sir. I came home to find my house had been burned down back in the late 70s. Burned down. Probably by a landlord. We're not sure. <laughs> See? They never, arsonists never did call. <laughs> but you lost virtually everything. Everything I had. Everything you had. I swear in my car. You know? Anybody else want to talk about when they were a victim? Yes, sir. I've been robbed a couple times, both at home and also the car and things like that. So you've been a victim of robbery? Also, you know, being, being a man of... of being a gay man, I've been, you know, accused and, and, and yelled at for being the fact that I'm gay and, you know, so verbally involved in black and other phrase. Yes, and I'm sure that that's ongoing. Anybody else? What? Yes, sir. While I was in seminary, my best friend who's a Jesuit priest and I were walking in the streets of San Francisco and were gay bashed by five kids in a car with golf clubs. And um, the story is so so poignant to me because a little old lady came running out of her house with a broom, <laughs> screaming, I've called the police. And then she started to, after these boys with the broom, and she really hadn't called the police, but she, she yelled that so that the boys would hear it. And so she was my good Samaritan. You had a Samaritan? Yeah, she literally saved her lives. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um. This is a, a business thing, but I was fired when I was working for Lockheed Aircraft in Burbank, California in 1954. And that was the day of the McCarthy witch hunt in the State Department. And everybody in the defense industry was very suspect. And uh, probably I was not just as discreet living in my youth as I could have been, but uh, um, I was let go. And uh, I let go, but they, they gave me a, a parallel movement that I'm specializing in advertising. I was just a man manager. I trained for this and loved being in Lockheed. And so um, that was I was a victim of, of, of McCarthyism and, uh, and, and the hate. So are you a real true blue communist right here in our midst here? Jesus <laughs> <laughs> well, is well, a communist. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> well, I'm sorry to hear about that, but I'm glad you found it. Other ways to are all learning experiences. You know. Right. Yes, ma'am. Uh, not personally, but my daughter and then my sons, we would be, uh, the word would be chastised because my daughter is developmentally disabled. And sometimes by adults that you think would know better, and often by children who should know better. And my sons would stick up for their sister, so it is a form of prejudice, which gets better. You know, I'm sorry to say the prejudice that we have where pe black people think they're being um, victims, and the police who gave their lives uh, in protecting the citizens. 
they are the ultimate Samaritans. Now, let's look at some other things here. Uh, for those of you that have had life experiences, when have you been or been shown mercy by someone? When have you shown <coughs> mercy or been shown mercy by someone else? Anybody have a story about that? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Helping a stranger who on the side of the road, or when I was a kid, we had that same type of thing where the car broke down, the truck driver came along and helped us get the car back together and you know, got us to the next stop. Yes, there are stories that, yes, ma'am. This story is like both. Mm -hmm. I was mugged on the streets of San Francisco, and these two kids were pulling me, they took my purse, and they were pulling me into this doorway it, under the cement wall and whatever was going on on the other side. This is like 9.30 in the morning. And I'm telling them to take my purse, but they're pulling me. And all of a sudden, there's this big white truck, huge, in the road. And big, tall, long guy comes out, and he's all in white, boots, everything. And he says, what's going on over there? And the kid with the knife stuck the knife into my side, but then they took off through that doorway with my purse. And the truck driver came over to me, and he said, you're going to be all right. And the police are on their way. And he got back and struck and drove off and he had a police car. That's my first angel. My second <coughs> is the story my son just told you. We were in Tennessee. I was headed to a job site. I took them with me as a little vacation. I called. I went to the um, phone. We were like maybe 30 feet from the next where phones were. So I was phoning the office to tell them I didn't know how I was going to get anywhere. Someone called AAA for me. I get back to the car, and here again, I go past this big truck, but this was a big man of color, and he was fixing the tire and putting the jack and everything back in the car. The kids were safe, and we drove home. That's my other major. Let me ask you a different question. How many of you have ever passed by on the other side of the road? You don't have to confess the story, but <laughs> I'm sure we've all done it. Uh, at one time or another, we said, we're not going to get involved. Uh, the police are coming. The paramedics are coming. We'll just not complicate our lives or get involved. We'll, you know, I'm sure we've all been in it. So this story, this Good Samaritan story, is a contemporary story. And when, when you study the Bible and you want to know what scripture is, scripture is when the story is so poignant that it's contemporary in every age. And this story is contemporary in every age. Now I want to ask you another question. You've been reading the headlines and watching the news all over. Um, describe a Good Samaritan story from the headlines that you've heard. Can anybody do it? Yes, sir. When the shootings in Orlando happened, um, where people were running back into the bar to get their friends out um, when they didn't know whether they were safe yet or not, um, to me was a, an act of, Samaritanism, Samaritanism. Uh, run, risking their own lives to make sure that one of their friends, yeah. you know, might not be there. Right. Any other stories out of the headlines? Can you describe the Good Samaritan story? Yes, right. Um, I think in line with that, what what went on in Dallas, as horrible as it was, we're hearing stories of people who were there at the protest who moved to help the police. Yep. And and to look out for them. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I don't have any problem. Um, I don't think the Good Samaritan story is about doing good for people. I think the story is about people that you don't expect to do good for you doing good. So just the fact that I was helpful to some other white gay man my own age or something like that doesn't count. <laughs> it's where 
might be helpful to some fundamentalist Christians, say, who, was, who had a, um, an automobile accident or, or being robbed or something like that. If I, saw, if I saw a fundamentalist church being arsoned, that's a good example for me, I guess. For me to call the cops or go rescue fundamentalists out of the church, that would be a good Samaritan. It's not. You know, I see those, those giant RVs that say Good Sam Club on them. Yeah. And I see people that have like a $60,000 purchase of this thing that they go around to national parks with. And the Good Sam Club, I guess, is where they help other people that have $60,000 RVs. <laughs> yeah. And that's not at all what the story's about. And it, it, the topic's been kind of corrupted to mean be nice to people, and it's not. It's about people you don't like being nice to. I think you make a really good point. When we talk about the Samaritan, we now talk about there are Samaritan centers, there are Samaritan hospitals, there are Samaritan ulcers. We think Samaritans are, you know, normal, regular folk, right? Good people. In Jesus' time, he's telling the story of the Samaritan because the Samaritan was who? An outcast. An outcast. People that didn't have, have no account, no, no rights, no recognition. They were, they were oppressed. They were persecuted. The Samaritans were the ones on the outside. And you're right. When, when you have people on the outside that are helping the people on the inside, that's the Samaritan story. But I, I don't want to give up the idea of doing good, though, because the Samaritan did good. And when we see ourselves, there are many people in this community here in the Bloom in the Desert community that know what it is to be on the outside of society, to know what it is to be separated, to be diminished, to be persecuted, to be um, you know, oppressed in one way or another. There are many people here that have many stories about that all their life long. You know what that is. So when the oppressed of this community rise up and help the the power community. That's the Samaritan story. So when have we seen that happen in our contemporary story? I'm thinking about these inmates that built out themselves to save the God. Okay. He's having a heart attack. Some inmates that save the God. Yeah. So the God Some that that the God was God having a medical so, yeah, they broke out of jail to save the guard. <laughs> where was this? What, yeah, where was it? I read it, but I don't remember where it was. Do you know where it was? Some prison. Yeah, it was a prison somewhere. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. I, I used to walk my dog in this same park in Washington, D.C. all the time, and I got to know a lot of the homeless people, and they looked forward to, to playing with my dog and interacting with the dog. I got to know them for over time. And I'd be amazed that so often um, one guy who rarely speaking came up one time and unwrapped in this uh, bunch of napkins and he had had a chicken, um, two chicken legs that he had gotten from somebody else that he was saving until he saw my dog again. So they were like four days old. And he'd been keeping him in his pocket just to have a chance to, to be able to give it to my dog. You know, and he was like, here me, I have a dog. I was like, here's this guy that's hungry and on the streets and he's sitting there with here, here on there. Yeah. And at the end when I got my cancer and I had to go tell the people I wasn't going to be around because I was going to be in treatment and they won't see the dog for a while. And they all said, oh, they didn't, you know, well, we'll take care of the dog for you. They said, we'll, we'll, you know, take, we'll walk in, we'll feed him, we'll build a little house in the park for him. If anything happens mm -hmm. to you, you know, we'll take care of him. And then at the very end, when the dog finally had to put down, the park, all said. these men came from everywhere to lay their hands. He said, give us one chance to heal him. And all these men, the homeless men, came and prayed over the dog to try to heal him before I put the dog down. Wow. Just that, that outpouring from that homeless community affected me so much that the least of us doing the most for me in those times. Yes. When, when Luke was writing, using the term holding the folk, using the term Samaritan, what ethnic group? Were these people known as Samaritans? Who were the outcasts? Um, I don't really have that description. All I know is that they, they were people living on the same land, in the same place, but because they were of certain kind of delineation, 
They were just outcasts. Kind of like our homeless population today. Well, our homeless? Uh, you could. There's a list. The gypsies or the gypsies. Yeah, gypsies. Just like that. Yeah. Uh, gay, <laughs> black, um, Any Muslim, immigrant, Muslim, yeah. Mexican, disabled, disabled, veterans. Veterans. I believe they were Jews, but they didn't believe the right things. They were like some kind of other brand of Christianity that we don't like and that doesn't like us. Right, yeah. yeah, I think you're right. I think that's correct. But nevertheless, they were among the people that lived there, and they were ostracized for one reason or for whatever reason it was. But we know that we have this experience now in our life. And when you see, when you read the stories of um, the young black men that are being shot by police, and you realize that that's been going on forever and ever and ever, it's just that we now know about it because of cell phone videos, uh, that doesn't make it right or wrong at any time. It's, it's wrong whenever you see it and whenever we know about it. But I think one of the lessons that I'd like to bring out here about the Good Samaritan that we don't hear enough of is that we know the story of victimhood. And we know the story of outsiders, of unexpected people who bring mercy and bring care. And that those people, even on the outside, are our neighbors, are our friends, are our brothers and sisters. Even the victim is our friend, our neighbor, our brother, our sister. But one of the questions we need to ask ourselves in this society now is when will we start reducing victimhood? When will we do things in this society where there are fewer victims? And I know that's a difficult question to answer. Not that this is a direct lesson from the Good Samaritan story, but it's a, it's a societal lesson from this story. When we look at the Good Samaritans that are required in our land right now, are required in our society right now, we require everybody to come up from wherever they are to care for those who are oppressed and hurt and victimized. But when are we going to be a peaceable nation again? When are we going to have fewer victims? When are we going to be able to say that the Good Samaritan story is an anomaly and not an everyday occurrence in the headlines everywhere we read them? It would be nice, I think, if we could work toward that. When I say it'd be nice, it's time now for the Levites and the priests of our society, the power society, the white privilege society, the people who are likely to pass by on the other side, must realize now that the, the, the amount of victims that are in our society are more than this society should be able to have to tolerate. When it comes time for the white privilege, the priests, the Levites, and those in power to say, we are now going to get involved, and we are going to be neighbors to these victims, and now we are going to do something about it. And it means we cannot pass by on the other side anymore. We cannot look the other way and say somebody else would take care of it. We have to write letters. We have to send the <coughs> protests. We have to uh, contact our uh, Congress and senators. We have to do these things. We have to get involved to get these things changed. If we don't, who's going to be the next victim? And can we tolerate? Yes, ma'am. My family had friends that came from, that were German, that came from and were in Germany during World War II. They knew many people that had helped the Jews. Yes. And when you can help somebody, when it, it threatens your life, and when you have such an evil force 
threatening you, but you extend the hand of fellowship and to protect that person. And I, I guess that's what we need to do now, but I think, I think we don't, like I personally, truthfully don't know how to do it. I mean, what do I do? Yeah, I can write a letter. Yeah, I But we need to do, letters. we actually need to do that. We need to influence our leaders. We need to influence those yeah, in think, power. I think you're right. I, like I, I wrote letters, um, I love writing this letter because I wrote it to the president and I copied in everybody. I put CCs to the senator and all the local congressmen and assemblymen. Great. And by the way, it was at that time Ronald Reagan, the president. And I got an answer and he had a person from the state, Dr. Gardefee, contact me and it was about the living situations that, that my daughter and other disabled people were in. So I do know from personal experiences that letters make a difference. But it, you know, you have to be, you have to, like you say, put yourself at risk to expose yourself to be on the side of, of where of you're writing this letter. And it, it's, I know that you're all sick and tired of hearing people being shot, including now police. We're sick and tired of it. But if we don't act to change it, if the people in power don't act to change it, you're only having the protesters protest and people diminish the protesters. And we only have the, the fringe people doing it and people diminish those people. Yes, sir. I think it's important also when we do have politicians to do support to make sure they know we thank them for that. And right. We made a point of uh, contacting Dr. Louise in our two centers about the, uh, the gun protests. So thank you for doing what you're doing. Yeah. Some, they tend to hear the opposite of it. Right. They you know there's a lot of us out here. Right. On their side. But see, that's getting involved too. When you can garner their support that way, and that's that's a wonderful thing. Because there are people that are doing good things, and we need to thank them for doing it. But if you're sick and tired of it all, like I am, yes, sir. Isn't that also part of the message of the Good Samaritan story that Jesus is saying, you must do more than love your neighbor; you must act on it. Exactly. Exactly. That's what the Samaritan did. He acted on it. And he acted on it being an outcast in society. He did what was right anyway. And that's significant. But I want to thank you for being part of this discussion. This was, I hope, helpful to you and, and hearing some of the stories that are around here. And my hope is that um, you all will not pass by on the other side. <coughs> Amen. 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 Thanks for your job. Oh God, this isn't very much. It's only a small part of what we earn and spend. But receive it as a symbol. Let it be a sign between you and us that we want to find and create the life and love that you offer. We are ready to be your people. Amen. Amen. saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen.